Welcome everybody to Assisi's Pet Owner Moments. Uh, today, we're going to talk about learning how to rehabilitate your pets at home. Our presenter today is Dr. Deirdre Caramonte, who received her DVM from Tufts University School of Medicine, and she is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Prior to that, she is a small animal rotating internship and internal medicine residency at the Animal Medical Center. While there, she was a staff internist and the director of the Tina Santiferidi Rehabilitation and Fitness Unit. Dr. Caramonte is certified in canine and equine rehabilitation and acupuncture. In current fields of interest are rehab, obesity, and geriatrics. Currently, she is the president of the Veterinary Medical Association of New York City, and she is the director of clinical education at Assisi Animal Health. Welcome, Dr. Caramonte. Hello, thank you everybody for joining us on this. Uh, it's beautiful where I am. Um, so we're gonna jump right in and talk about um, ways to rehabilitate your pets at home. And obviously I can't cover everything, but we're certainly gonna cover a lot. Uh, um, there's questions at the end, I think, and you can also write to us. But that is my uh, 14 and a half, maybe now 15 year old rescue Chloe who is actually receiving a treatment um, as she's laying there. And you can tell she looks like she's pretty much in heaven. Oh, how do I... So one of the things that we would like to discuss is sort of the change of um, how the change in the veterinary landscape about pain um, has occurred over the last 10 years. And what we have come to in um, our field is basically we need a, a way to judge uh, some criteria to figure out how painful our cats and dogs are. And this is most easily done at home when they're relaxed because when they come into the veterinary office, we figure out that they're uncomfortable, but really a lot of the scoring now has gone to the owners. So on the left is an example of the canine brief pain inventory, and it's used in many, many uh, research studies uh, across the planet. Uh, it's developed by uh, University of Pennsylvania, and it has the owner just describe uh, what they think their level of pain is, how uh, much they can function, et cetera, going upstairs or getting into the car, et cetera, getting up, ability to walk, et cetera. So we've really shifted from sort of the veterinarian having the, um, the knowledge of judging pain to the owner. And on the right side is uh, what we love, the feline musculoskeletal pain index, the FMPI. And you can find that on painfreecats.org. And it is a questionnaire um, that should be answered on and answer questions. And it should come out with an algorithm to see if your cat is in pain and if you then need to find a veterinarian. But these are two very good tools to use uh, for the owner. Oh, you're annoying me today. Okay. Now, one um, message that I do want to hit home with is many over-the-counter medications are not safe for pets. And some are safe for dogs and extremely toxic for cats, etc. So you should not attempt to give your pets any human medication unless that medication and dosage has been previously cleared by your veterinarian. And it's just unfortunate that sometimes we, you know, we think, hey, it's a, an aspirin, hey, it's an Advil, et cetera. Um, and one dose of an over-the-counter medication can cause life-threatening reactions. So here's a number for animal poison control, a very good number uh, to have handy. And second, uh, when they're talking, they always mention Dr. Google in the internet search. Um, so I love Google. I use it every day. Uh, and that is very good for information at our fingertips, but not good for advice. So please check with your veterinarian before giving any over-the-counter medications, etc. All right, so what we're going to talk about today, what the owners can do at home, uh, is passive range of motion, uh, cryotherapy or ice therapy, heat therapy, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, massage, and therapeutic exercises. So our first one I love, 
I'm just gonna play it while we're speaking, is passive range of motion. And that's a movement of a limb performed without a muscle contraction by whomever, owner, vet, technician. Passive range of motion helps prevent joint contracture and shortening of the tissue. So if the dog or cat is Deirdre, your internet must be going in and out because your voice keeps disappearing. Hmm. I don't, um, I don't know what I can do necessarily about that unless I just get rid of this for a second and check. Okay. Um, that, that does not usually happen when you speak, so that's why I'm mentioning it. There we go. All right, let's see if that's better. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, this also helps bathe every joint. So what's important is all the nutrients in a joint get circulated throughout the whole joint and any waste products get diffused out. And it's important to maintain a range of motion that's within the patient's comfort level. Now, this patient you could tell is laying down uh, it's not sedated, and obviously it's not being bothered by any of these exercises. But in any type of situation, unless you're dealing with a fracture, passive range of motion is really a wonderful, wonderful way to keep all those tissues elastic, et cetera. Um, now, because passive range of motion is not performed with a muscle contraction, the person is doing the muscle contracting, it's not considered a strengthening exercise. So this is more of your, any dog that's down or paralyzed, um, it's very imperative to have this. But we will talk about strengthening exercises because those are important for at-home rehab. So ice therapy uh, decreases muscle spasms by decreasing the muscle metabolism and decreasing byproducts. And byproducts will act as irritants. It also will cause a peripheral muscle constriction and will slow down nerve conduction velocity. And why that's important is because that's how they register pain is through all the superficial nerves that go up to the spinal cord and then go up to the brain and register as pain. So if we can slow down that nerve conduction, they don't get the feeling of pain. Ice is usually used during any acute phase of injury within the first three days. Um, and ice is very inexpensive. Um, and it's good for acute injury, but it's also good for an acute exacerbation of a chronic injury. Very good for pain relief. All right, moving on to heat therapy is used after the first 72 hours. And this will help to decrease joint stiffness, relieve muscle spasms, reduce swelling, and increase circulation to an area. So first, you want to take care of slowing everything down. Now that the inflammatory mediators are gone, you want to bring circulation in to help increase uh, joint stiffness and edema. Uh, now, when in doubt, if you're in doubt, definitely uh, stick to ice. Okay, through various techniques, um, massage can increase arterial, venous, and lymphatic flow. It can break down and prevent tissue adhesions. And while a lot of uh, practitioners, I will say probably of every um, dis discipline uh, would scoff at massage as being a medical treatment, but it really, they've done many, many studies on massage therapy. And through sensory input to the peripheral tissues, nerves, muscles, um, you can actually 
achieve relaxation, which is so important. And also a lot of patients will develop scar tissue almost. So let's take a very old arthritic Labrador retriever who's had two surgeries on each knee or surgery on each knee and his shoulders must be bearing the burden of always carrying him around, trying to get him up from a sitting position, uh, trying to take a lot of the weight off. And so just massaging those sore uh, neck tissues can really help make a difference. And I just love this video. <laughs> Now, even though that's a funny cartoon and I love it and it makes me happy, it is really ridiculous how some patients really enjoy massage and can just totally put them into um, a very, very relaxed mode. All right, next we're gonna talk about one of my favorites, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Sometimes it's misleadingly called magnetic field therapy, but it's not about magnets. It's pulsing electromagnetic fields. And the problem is when people talk about these things and throw these terms around, it's kind of like the term radiation. It goes from A to Z. So you really have to sort of know what you're talking about. And I could actually talk about PEMF for several hours, which I won't do that today. Um, but PEMF is an active electromagnetic waveform that's delivered by an antenna. So if you can see our signature technology to begin with was the CC loop. And in the white area is the battery pack. And they, that emits a waveform. And then the black part is the antenna. And that actually delivers the electromagnetic waves to and through tissue. Uh, so all these sort of combined parameters about the signal, the height of the signal, the length of the signal, how many times it bursts per second, all make up um, the PEMF signal. And what's also confusing is there are other PEMF devices on the market and everybody when they're talking about PEMF being a wonderful technology because it really is, is they use everybody else's research um, to bolster their websites. And the problem is you can't, you actually literally have to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So, uh, and pick a company that stands by what they do with research. And these are some of um, our products. Um, the Clinica is an in-clinic pad, uh, which is actually what Chloe was laying on um, at home. The ACC loop right here, uh, the loop lounge, which fits into a sleepy pod carrier, and my ancient 15-year-old chronic renal failure cat who was having some difficulties and um, uh, pain recovering for a dentistry, um, he slept in that. That was his favorite spot to be. And then um, the loop aid, which is a Velcroable system to put the loop sort of anywhere you want. Um, when you use PMF, uh, depending on what the diagnosis is, and you can talk with your veterinarian, uh, but basically for an acute uh, condition, we recommend using it every two to four hours. It's a 15 minute treatment period. And if it's a chronic situation, we usually use it couple times a day and owners sort of can know when they don't need as much PMF therapy and they can titrate down. But it's just a simple 15 minute treatment per day. And I should also mention about PMF. Some people worry when you're talking about electromagnetic field therapy, does it cause cancer or anything like that? Um, you can imagine how many people are on their cell phones every day. We are one one thousand, one thousand, I can't say that, one over a thousand less than a cell phone. So we do not cause cancer. Now, therapeutic exercises are actually the cornerstone of rehabilitation. Why is that? So we use ice, heat, massage, and PMF for pain relief. But you know that if you wanna get in shape and strengthen something, you gotta exercise, and that's the deal. So 
we usually use these modalities, ice, heat, PMF, massage, either before or after we actually put them into an exercise program. And this should be, you know, um, detailed by your veterinarian or your therapist, but very, very important for strengthening, balance, coordination, retraining, and conditioning. And people don't even understand, they can't, it's, let me, I'll make it more simple. Even something as simple as a paw shake, which this lovely yellow lab is doing on the left, he is exercising his elbow, which elbow is one of the harder ones to target, but doing paw shakes can absolutely help uh, strengthen um, an arthritic joint that is now pain-free by using our other modalities. Cavaletti rails, I love. They're very, very simple to use. Those are those white ones. Those are little PVC pipes, but people at home have used ladders. They can lay down broom handles, really anything that the dog has to step over. And if you can imagine this Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, probably when it walks around the neighborhood does not have such a high leg lift just by walking. And just by doing this simple exercise, it's non-concussive, obviously the dog does not look stressed, that that dog is actually using different muscles, probably even engaging his core to get over those um, poles. So even something as simple as that is really a good exercise. <clears throat> Three-legged standing. So one thing that we wanna do if we're rehabilitating something in an acute phase of post-injury or they're you know, they had, um, they're out playing Frisbee and they got hurt and they're just, you know, they rested a couple days. Now you're going to start again. Um, you want an isometric exercise and that is where um, a joint angle doesn't change. So this is a static photo. It's not a movie because all I was doing was holding up that back leg. So what does that do? Well, it puts the weight on all the other limbs and it makes that dog, that model is Finnegan. It makes Finnegan just sort of weight shift. So it's a non-concussive exercise that helps. And also he has to engage his core to enact all three other legs to bear the weight. When you're doing this exercise, usually you would hold that leg up for, I mean, some dogs can actually have that leg held up uh, probably 15 seconds, see if they can tolerate that. And the other thing is I am not supporting his weight in that photo. He is supporting his weight on all the other legs. So when you're done with that leg, you can go to the next hind leg and go around the dog because each time you lift a leg like that and it shifts weight elsewhere, it's a non-concussive way to enhance strength in the other limbs and engage the core. And engaging the core is really important in older dogs, especially dogs prone to disc disease. Um, also, I think really good for cats because they end up all being hunched over um, as they get older and then having difficulty jumping up onto the counter to get their food, etc. So then we can graduate to para standing. So para standing, otherwise called a snoopy, is uh, this is opposing legs which is also excellent besides strengthening uh, the neck and the trunk, but also good for flexibility. Um, some dogs that actually um, do a lot of hunting work, nose work, scent work, or always have their nose, neck extended way out. And this is a good exercise for uh, strengthening those areas. So once you do um, you know, the front right and the hind left, then you can switch to the left front and the hind right. You can also do same side para standing, hold up both left legs, both right legs. And again, the goal is not to have you be bearing the weight of the dog. They should be bearing the weight themselves. Something simple is doing plank exercises. Um, and this is a very good one to, again, strengthen the core muscles. And depending on whether you have those two balls under the front limbs. So this is putting the weight onto the hind limb. So a dog that would have, uh, who has a arthritis, be post-operative knee surgery. Uh, so in small breed, a luxating patella or a cruciate ligament or whatever it is. So that animal is shifting its weight on the hind limbs. You don't have to use those balls. You can use a Reebok stepper. You can use a pillow. Um, you can use your own thigh if they stand up on you. 
and then you can gently just push the hind, hind end over with one hand just to sort of get them to weight shift onto their opposing limb. And then when you're done with that, if you need to strengthen the front limbs, then you could put whatever step or balls underneath the hind limbs and have them be sort of facing downward. Now, assistive devices. I really like putting uh, this slide up here for a couple reasons. One, oh my God, I can't remember this dog's name, but this dog had a, um, had a uh, intervertebral disc. He blew a disc and had surgery. And it took this dog nine months to walk again. The owners were very dedicated. Oh, his name's Buster. Buster was uh, loved by his parents that put in nine months of physical therapy. And one of the things that dogs really like, and when you're rehabbing pets, wherever they are at home or in the clinic, is they want to be in the position that they're normally used to being in. So if you take a dog who's paralyzed and all of a sudden all it's doing, it's laying on its side, it's not really used to laying on its side, maybe, maybe for a nap, but that's not how he or she viewed life before. And you're not really going to strengthen muscles. So assistive devices such as a cart or a wheelchair do not necessarily mean end stage for the dog. It's not like we don't have any hope left, let's throw them in a cart, which is fine. But in the interim, when we're working on these dogs, this cart has put Buster in the correct posture. And look, he kind of forgot his back legs aren't working. You could see the way that his toes are, that he doesn't actually feel his toes. And he's totally focused on Nate in front of him, probably with a treat. So he feels like a real dog. And that's really good for their mental well being to be able to do the jobs they used to do. And sometimes some of those positive um, reinforcements, the endorphins, the memories, you know, we don't really understand everything about the neurological system. But I can tell you that a dog like this, with this type of apparatus, is gonna, if he's gonna walk, he's gonna walk sooner in this situation than he will laying on a side and being picked up every four hours with a sling or a towel underneath them to go outside and then have the owners perform range of motion, et cetera. So assistive devices are really, really good, not only for end stage, but for interim treatment. They're doing amazing, amazing work with orthotics and prosthetics if there happens to be an amputation. I mean, they're putting prosthetics on elephants and you name it. So I'm sure there's 10 uh, wildlife shows on prosthetics, but orthotics and splints are really good. Um, they've come a long way. One mistake or one misinterpretation um, is that you can probably never really buy an orthotic off the shelf. Um, it really should be made for that animal because every animal is so different and it needs to absolutely configure to that animal's leg as to not cause rub spots, et cetera. Uh, but there's a whole host of good assistive devices out there. So uh, they can come into the clinic and see me and I usually send them home with homework, but this is you rehabbing your pets at home. So one, uh, you should keep an activity scale or an activity log. And sometimes um, even we get sort of like, oh, you know, he's not really walking much better, but if you look at a video from three weeks ago and a video now, sometimes you're seeing different things. So it's really good to write down um, activities that are performed. And we like to prescribe uh, three exercises three times a day, probably for five or 10 repetitions. And during that time, when a dog or cat is starting out being rehabilitated, they're probably not going to be able to do 10 or 15 repetitions right away um, or not going to be able to walk entirely across the kitchen. So it's really good to sort of uh, the owner to keep a log and tell us what they've been doing. Um, and also after we've done with that exercise or those exercises for that day at night, are they exhausted? You know, are they going to bed much earlier and sleeping? So if they sleep longer than they're used to, then you know you've probably tired them out doing too many exercises and you should back off uh, a couple repetitions um, for a few days until they get back into their comfort zone and then try to ramp up again. And um, 
it's many times just, um, you know, what the owner deems is best for the dog or cat, um, et cetera.